Thanks. Uh, yeah, one, one uh, quick thing. So I, I do go to a lot of DevOps days, and I'll show you how many in a little bit. This is actually, I'll tell you right now, it's my 30th. But, um, and actually, there was a bunch that wasn't counted in the early days. But um, it's the local organizers. They, they work their brains off. So I'm a core organizer, and I watch all this chaos turn into these amazing events. So uh, when you see, you know, you're here, you're going to eat for free, you're going to hear some amazing speakers, um, and they do a lot of work to make these things turn out like so magical and sparkly princesses. Um, this is the DevOps State of Union. I, I've, um, I've done a lot of these kind of quasi-keynotes. Um, if you want, the presentation is there, so you've got about eight seconds to type it down if you want. I'll put it out on slide. It's already on SlideShare. I'll uh, obviously tweet it later. Um, I am Batsy Galoop. Um, that's a hard one to shut down. I will say if you have any questions and there's anything on a slide, I recommend a lot of books and things like that. So I've um, created actually a little shortcut Twitter <laughs> Because uh, nobody gets the Batsk Loop one right on the first try, so BGLP. So, and it's on most of the slides. So quickly, um, 35 years in IT, started out in Exxon. I actually was one of the early cloud evangelists at Canonical. Um, I was the ninth person in at Chef, um, helped develop the customer-facing business there. Um, and then the last three years, so I, I'm a, a mind a chef. I'm a failed startup guy for 35 years. But the last three years have been very nice to me. I had a company that I uh, worked with. We sold to Dell, and Stratius. And six months ago today, I sold a company called Soccer Plane to Docker. So, um, so I'm at Docker now. Um, this is my 30th DevOps. Um, I'm actually one of the DevOps core organizers. I was at the original Ghent. Um, I actually brought the first DevOps days to the US and uh, iTunes and blah, blah, blah. So the agenda for this presentation is I, I was asked to kind of capture what's going on in DevOps. And because I go to a lot of DevOps days, I spend a lot of time with DevOps people. Um, so I, I figured this is the best story to tell. I'm going to talk a little bit about taxonomies, kind of loose taxonomies, and I'll, that, that'll make sense in a minute. I'll talk about something called the DevOps survey. That's actually the fourth year that it's done. Uh, we'll talk about DevOps in the enterprise, what's going on there. And if we have time, we'll talk about technology. So, <laughs> it'll actually be Q&A or technology. Uh, and so I got a lot to cover. I'm going to talk fast. Um, so in 2009, I, I went to the first DevOps days in Ghent. There was about 40 people. It was amazing. Uh, Damon Edwards and myself, a couple other people, Andrew Schaefer, uh, Mark Hinkle, we organized the first DevOps days in Silicon Valley. Um, me and Damon had already been doing this DevOps Cafe podcast. And after that session, or those two days that we, in fact, it was a one day, I think, the first one. It was at LinkedIn. And um, we were so blown away because we had 300 people show up. So we had gone from, from um, basically about 40 people. Actually, Chris was there. I got, that's where I met Chris. And, uh, and there was about from 40 to like 300. And it was just crazy. I mean, it was this renaissance of people that were like screaming to get out of the box about this thing. And, and, um, and Damon and I just did a whole podcast where we tried to explain what happened. And we accidentally came up with a loose taxonomy called CAMS, Culture, Automation, Measurement, and Sharing. And, uh, and, and really, we were just trying to explain what, what was this thing we saw. And, and it, it has kind of stuck now. It's like total loose taxonomy. Um, you know, culture, uh, it's about, I always say that, you know, without the C, forget everything else. Some people say um, CAMS, not AMS. Automation, Measurement, and Sharing. So we did that. Um, and, and I wrote, I was at OpsCode at the time, chef now, I'm, I'll always call it OpsCode, sorry. Um, I wrote this blog article that, again, kind of stands the time. I always get a little kick when I see somebody tweet, hey, have you seen this blog post? And it's what DevOps, it's where I kind of describe CAMs. Um, so, but what I learned over the last year and a half or so, I've been, you know, I've become a kind of, a, I, I'm like a junkie of different things. Like complexity is something I'm very interested in, complexity and infrastructure. And... Um, and so I, I think a lot about loops, you know, OODA loops and uh, cybernetic feedback loops and all those kind of things. And I've got a lot of books if, uh, that you'll see if you want to learn more about those things. But I realized that something that Damon and I missed early on is CAMS was really a feedback loop. Um, and, and so, you know, what am I telling you? That if you hear CAMS, I would say I'm going to re-describe it now. It, it is culture, which is really improvement, so continuous improvement. It is delivery, which we, you know, you're going to hear a lot about continuous delivery, or you already have. Continuous learning is measurement, co uh, continuous collaboration. And it, it is a cybernetic feedback in, loop in that your culture truly feeds your automation. Don't bother if you don't understand your culture. Your measurement is the measurement of how successful, how are you measuring, what are you doing? And then 
what you do is you share the results. You share them externally, you come to DevOps days and you talk about them, or you share them internally where you're trying to build more people into, or bringing people into the fold. Actually, Target is a very interesting company. Um, they are, to me, one of the most advanced, and large scale, what would be considered legacy enterprises that are doing incredible things with DevOps. And, and they have this DevOps dojo. And they literally think, in fact, their quote is, we have a culture and um, sharing sandwich here. Um, actually, you know, taking the CAMS idea. Um, but as acronyms go, or um, taxonomies, a good friend of mine, Dave Zwieback, recently, actually beginning of the year, did this blog article. Um, and what I did, when I said this presentation, I sent out to a whole bunch of people said, hey, tell me your top three things. And I have a slide for all those people at the end. Tell me your top three things that you think is important in DevOps. And, and Dave reminded me of this presentation he did, which this ICE. And I think it's brilliant because I like this um, taxonomy, um, loose taxonomy again, um, inclusivity, complexity, and empathy. And, and he explains that in his blog. What I'm going to walk you through, um, you know, in other words, we're getting better at our craft. You know, me and Damo are a bunch of just, you know, drunk, not really, but, you know, on a podcast, hey, what happened last week, you know? And, and, but, you know, let's come out with this thing called CAMS, you know? And now you got guys like Dave Zwieback and lots of other people that are actually pinpointing a lot finer of what we're doing here. And we're learning. We're in a feedback loop ourselves, right? Um, and so, inclusion, do not make fun of that graph. I'm learning R. And that's my first attempt at a cool graph in R. So screw you if you make fun of it. Uh, it took me a lot of work to get the two sides and normalize the data. So I'm pretty proud of myself. Um, but anyway, the data. Um, so if you look at, I, I took the, um, the amount of DevOps days we have per year. And I took the, uh, the DevOps survey, which I'll talk about a little bit. And so we started off with one in Ghent. We had uh, about three or four uh, in 2010. And then in 2012, 2013, we took off. Um, we went up to like 16 or 19, I think, and now this year there's going to be 25. So we are building a bigger audience. In fact, it, it heartens me when I hear at these DevOps days, in the early days, you know, around uh, 2000, between 2010, 2011, you'd ask how many people this is your first DevOps days, and you'd, you'd see about a third, less than a third of people raise their hand. Um, about a year and a half ago, you started seeing about 50-50. Now I'm seeing 80-90 first timers at almost every DevOps stage, right? So we are definitely do, we're building inclusivity here. And then um, the, the DevOps survey, it's in its fourth year, so I had to have a couple of zeros. But in 2013, um, it was actually 1,000 respondents. And it was the first real interesting one. I thought the, no disrespect to Puppet and my good friend Gene Kim, but the first couple I was like, yeah, all right. You, know, you surveyed like 500 people, you surveyed not. But then in um, 2014, last year, it, it got real. They brought in a data scientist. Um, the data really started showing there were 10,000 respondents. And this year, uh, 20,000 people responded. So you know, in the early days of DevOps, we had these kind of guesses. Like, you know, I saw DevOps. I started my career in the enterprise. right? And when I, early days of DevOps, I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be great for the enterprise next year. Oh, it's going to be great next year. It's going to be great. And, and I couldn't really do, I, I could walk into large enterprise, I'm saying, you're doing it wrong. I don't say really you're doing it wrong, but you know, there's a better way, but I had no data. And in 2014 was the first time, there were two data points there, that uh, another one I'll show you later, which is something called the DevOps Enterprise Summit, um, but where we actually could say, people are doing it. And let me show you the results of what they're doing. Um, um, diversity, um, we, in the beginning, it was an all boys club, and not by design. It just was that way. And then for many years, I, there was a D Dominica Diagiannis. She's a brilliant woman. I love her. She's the, the Kanban princess, if you will. She would be, that, I mean, there were other people, but literally I would always think that poor Dominica around all these dopey men. And, and what we've seen is diversity in lots of ways. And now we've got core organizers like Bridget Comrade. Um, we've got Jennifer Davis who they reference her book. She runs the Silicon, in fact, I've handed off my Silicon Valley. It was hard for me to, to give it away, but she runs it brilliantly now. Um, just a lot of Sasha here, you know, locally. We've got just, uh, we, we're really getting better at this diversity thing. Uh, the Code of Conduct, the first time we had Code of Conduct was last year, 2014 in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the first one. Andrew Schaefer, God bless him. He basically was the first one, you know, somebody can correct me, but that's the first one I remember. And now it's in every one. And we're serious. Any harassment. Um, 
And then I'm going to talk a little about security now, how we've, we've been able to bring in other groups, security network. Um, so the, how many people are rugged? DevOps rugged, right? So some of the hardcore security people on the planet, and, and Gene Kim is the maven here. So Gene is part of both communities. Uh, Gene likes to say, or he does say, that I'm the one that finally convinced them that DevOps wasn't a sham. And once he figured that out, he actually took that to the uh, security community, and primarily a gentleman named Josh Corman, who I think is amazing. And, and, and when he put, the light bulb went off, when Josh says this, uh, this thing, he says, um, he told Gene when he finally figured out DevOps is real, that this is the end of security as we know it. Right? And, and you have to follow, I don't have time to go into the details. We had Josh Corman on our, our podcast just recently. It hasn't gone up. It'll be up in a few days. But they created the Rugged Manifesto. Um, and it's, you know, rugged.org. And, you know, here, I recognize that my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. Um, one last thing about Josh Corman. He, he, I'm passionate. He's passionate about saving lives. So um, he, he sees security and security in the world, so software eating the world as a life and death problem. Um, there's something called Gauntlet. Um, shout out to James Wickett, local organizer in, um, hey, the hand went up, uh, in, um, out in the Austin gang. Um, and um, it's uh, using Cucumber for security. I mean, basically figuring out heart bleed with Cucumber, right? Like, like that's cool. All right, Josh Corman, who I mentioned, is on this mission. Me and him are giving a presentation together at DevOps, uh, the DevOps Enterprise Summit. And we're going to do good guy, bad guy. I'm going to do why, um, why containers are awesome for uh, immutable delivery, immutable infrastructure. If you want to talk about that later, we, I can. And, and Josh is going to say, wait a minute, John, that's a black hole. And, 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 and he's going to talk about something called supply chain. And it's really interesting. It comes from Deming. I'm a big Deming fan. He's a big Deming fan. And we're talking about how do you, um, the problem is you got open source is awesome. But the unawesomeness of open source is it's a supply chain nightmare. Right? You think you write 300 lines of code, there's really a million lines of code behind that. And so there's things like Heartbleed, and there's basically shell shock, and there's, there's really nasty things. In fact, Verizon, the, the Verizon does a report every year on vulnerabilities, and 95, where do you hear this? I got this from Josh. 95% of all the compromises in 2014 were basically 10 known CVEs, vulnerabilities. Here's where it gets even worse. Eight of those 10 were over 10 years old, right? So Josh is trying to save the world from open source. And, and supply chain is about minimizing, minim, minimizing your vendors and quality control. It's pure Deming. So he's thinking about, like, if you're going to use a logging framework in open source, pick one. Stabilize on a particular version. And more importantly, and the thing that we're going to really talk a lot about is a bill of materials in everything you build. So if, in other words, my saving grace for immutable delivery is that um, if you have a bill of material in that artifact that is delivered as immutable in the, um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, please get me later. But uh, it, when you deliver it in the infrastructure, it has a bill of material very much like what Toyota did. And if you read this book, you'll realize why, the, um, why Toyota just beat the hell out of Chevy Volt. Um, so that was the I, inclusivity. Um, the, the C is complexity. Um, how many people have, so here's the thing, right? A few years ago, um, you had a couple of companies that were massively scalable, extremely complex infrastructures. You have Google, you have Facebook, there's a short list. Today, there's hundreds. I will argue by the end of this decade, there'll be thousands, right? So, um, so we need to look for who's dealing with complexity in the right way. How many people have heard of Chaos Monkey? So yeah, just about everybody. Good, good. So I don't have to explain it. I save like a minute. Um, the, um, but you don't get to chaos. I had Adrian Cockroft on our DevOps podcast. You don't get to basically killing live production servers unless you have a resilient infrastructure. And I've talked a lot to Adrian about this, like how do you get the chaos monkey from zero? How do you go zero, zero to um, chaos monkey? Adrian likes to say, so Adrian Cockroft is the person who uh, is most credited for the architecture of Netflix. And Netflix... Whether you hate them or love them, they have built probably the most premier architecture for scalable infrastructure as we know it today. I, I will take any arguments for somebody who's doing it better. Um, I'm not saying there isn't, but he, what he did, he said, you know, when, he, when you try to congratulate him, he'll say, John, what I did is I took the right book and gave it to the right person. 
And so if you've ever read Mike Nygaard's Release It, um, Mike Nygaard's not here, is he? He's from this area. Oh, I'd love it if he's here. No, nope, darn it. Um, the, um, there's something called circuit breaker patterns in there. And it's a really interesting idea of how to do infrastructure at scale. If, you know, just like we do circuit breakers in our house, we don't like blow up everything and turn it off when this thing gets overloaded. So it's a pattern which you, have, you develop infrastructure such that when this circuit breaker, this is just the only thing that gets isolated. All the other transactions, and you model how that. That allows you to get to an environment where you can do things like Chaos Monkey. The other book that he recommends to people, and he says that this was another book he passed to somebody, is Sidney Decker's Drift into Failure. I, you know, if anybody, how many people follow John Ospar? Right? Quite, you know, a fair amount. Like, you should all follow John Ospar. All right? Find out who he is, start following him. John is a big fan of Sidney Decker, and a lot of people who talk about um, about human safety, um, human factors. The, Sidney Decker is not a computer scientist. He's the one that gets called in when a baby dies at a hospital to find out what the human factors were that caused that. He's the one when there, in fact, his first gig was that airline fatality in South America that had, um, it had Airbus, and it, act, and it actually, uh, an autopilot recorrected the pilot's directions to come back and hit a mountain. That was, that's how he got into writing these books. Um, how many people heard Mark Burgess? Uh, not a whole lot. How many people heard of Chef and Puppet? Right, so there would be no Chef or Puppet without Mark Burgess. He, he designed and developed this, this idea. He's a physicist who turned into a computer scientist who basically had to solve a problem because they asked him to take care of the computer systems at a university he was at. And, um, and he thinks a lot about complexity. That book is a hard book to read. I am telling you. Let, let me say this. If you know what a Planck constant is, you'll have a blast. If you don't know what a Planck constant is, you are going to be Googling the shit out of every other word in that book. But either way, it's a fantastic book. And I told him that should be a college curriculum, that book. It's an amazing book if you want to understand complexity. And then the last book I read is um, this gentleman, Jeff Susna. This is a really, really good book. Short read. You don't need to Google everything. He explains it really well. I just finished uh, reading it. I love it. I mean, I, I think he put, uh, he explained cybernetics to me. I didn't really understand it fully. Um, it, it, I, I, I can't tell you. So there are a lot more books. But, um, and if you say, John, I ain't reading any of those. You're out of your mind. Go ahead and read Designing Delivery. Um, another thing, so, so now you're saying, oh my God, please get this guy off the stage. He's killing me. Um, Kenevan, and don't you love the spelling, Kenevan? Um, uh, Dave Snowden, um, a Welsh, from Welsh, it's a Welsh spelling. Um, I'm going to spend too much time. It's really interesting. I'm seeing some really smart people implement this. There's great discussions. I'm still trying to find a place for it. I, I get it. It's, it's a framework for dealing with complexity. The short version is there are four quadrants. There are things like known knowns, things that you can look at, uh, categorize, and react. Uh, other things that are basically kind of known unknowns. Um, you sense, then you analyze. You can't really categorize. They're not really categorizable. In fact, maybe they turn into obvious after repeated. You move into complex, which is um, where these are um, emergent things, emergent patterns. Again, we're all talking about complexity here. Environments where they start getting up to servers that are unmanageable by people. Um, and then finally, chaotic, which is your kind of black swan, your, um, you know, uh, uh, metaphorically, your 10 sigmas, those kind of things. Um, it, it's a very interesting pattern and framework for complexity. And then finally, the E in ICE um, is uh, empathy. Michael talked about this a little bit. He talked about the uh, uh, inclusion and empathy. Um, so it's funny, you know, going back to me and Damon trying to figure out what DevOps was, and in fact, all the, the original people who were involved in the discussion early on, we knew culture was a big part of it, but, um, but the, um, like, dev and ops, right? That's an empathy story. But it took Jeff Susner, the author that I described, he wrote a blog article at the beginning, I think, of 2014, yeah, and, and he said that the essence of DevOps is, is empathy. And it was a brilliant article. In fact, Tim O'Reilly retweeted like, man, I could just write a blog article that Tim O'Reilly retweets. You know, that just, that's the thing. Uh, uh, when you can do that, you've made it, right? Um, the, um, but it was a great article. It was like, really, to be honest with you, I was a little jealous. Like, you know, why didn't I think of that, right? But, um, but, but it was brilliant. And, and again, back to Zwieback, Dave Zwieback turning this into an acronym because this is important. It's how we think about, you know, again, uh, Michael's discussion this morning about how we think about 
what we're doing here today. You know, are we listening and learning, right? Um, you, know, um, you know, early on, we, you know, we talked about, like, how do we preach, to, how do we build prescriptive models for DevOps? So me, Gene, Damon, Jez, a bunch of people talked a lot. Um, I learned a lot, actually, from, from you, Chris. Um, some of the things in an upcoming book are finally going to come out that, that like, I directly learned from you. Uh, the, uh, Chris has been my mentor for many years, to be honest with you. Um, he's one of the unsung heroes in this, in this space that doesn't get as much credit as some other people do. Um, but um, embedded engineers. He is one of the guys who invented this. Um, the idea of putting somebody from you know, just whatever, but the, the model most commonly known was you took an ops person and you just put them in the dev team. They become part of the stand-up routine. That was a forced form of empathy. I mean, one of the early stories Chris told me is like somebody would raise their hand and say, they'd say, well, let's put the file directories like this. And the one guy would go, yeah, you know, you can do that, but it's going to piss those guys off. Right? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they didn't really care, right? It was just somebody pointing out to them, like, if you did it this way, oh, OK, we could do it that way. Um, blameless postmortems, another hour-long subject. Dave Zwiebeck does a, um, a three-day course on it. Um, it's a very important, um, OK? But I had 35, but we're good. Um, safety culture. Um, this is important too. Safety culture. There's a lot we're talking about. This it goes back to Sidney Decker, what John Ospar is talking about. Um, Dr. Woods is. A, if you look at some of the velocity presentations of the last couple of years, we've they've injected some really interesting. Again, not IT people talking about other industry, industries that have successfully built a mindset of this safety culture. I got some slides on it in a little bit, but. Uh, it, the end is that um, empathy is not, this is not really a feedback loop, but empathy is a core part of inclusion and complexity, right? In fact, that, you know, in terms of collusion, it's about listening and learning, right? It's about um, complexity. It's about cybernetic or feedback loops and learning, All right? Let's get this kind of learning thing. Um, the Western model is pretty interesting. I'm getting tight on time. This is in a DevOps survey. It's kind of rephrased. Um, this uh, Ron Westrom. I learned this actually from Jez Humble, actually. Um, it's, it's the three types of organizations, pathological, bureaucratic, and generative. Um, you can see, I, I think, like, you know, the messenger is shot in a pathological. Messengers are tolerated. Messengers are trained. In fact, I think failure is another interesting. Failure is covered up. A bureaucratic is, organization is just and merciful. In fact, Sidney Decker talks a lot about just culture. Like, we as human beings are, like, so stuck in this just culture mindset that everything has to be weighed. And it's so hard for us to get into kind of blameless postmortems and thinking about justice has no part of this. It's about learning and understanding. So when things go wrong, our human nature is to go blame somebody. Even though we say to DevOps, you know, we don't blame anybody. We're all, like, the truth of the matter is we still kind of navigate to there. And, and we need to like just punch and punch our brains to think about what, and this is why I think Decker is so important. Um, hey, um, the Phoenix Project, how many people have heard of the Phoenix Project? Excellent, great. Um, for four years, three and a half years, Gene, myself, Patrick DeBar, Jez Humble, and John um, uh, have been working on this book. We've had some false starts. October, it's finally coming out, right? So it has always been designed as the prescriptive guide for this book. People always ask, well, I read the book, Gene, it's awesome. How do I do it? And it's, it's empathy because that's a novel, right? That is also a novel, right? So we. Um, in there, we were seeing the perspective of characters in a data center that looks very much like ours. <laughs> you know, like, hey, I, I know that guy, I know that person, right? And everybody who reads the book is like, they tell Gene, like, did you sneak into my company? You know, um, interesting enough, it's actually a rewrite of somebody called Elliot Gorat, who years ago everybody would say the same thing to Elliot Gorat. Um, burnout, I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, I, we, maybe we can have an old session on this. I wrote a blog article at the beginning of this year. Uh, about uh, a suicide in the LA DevOps community that just hit me off guard. I almost cry now when I even explain it. I don't have time to explain it. Um, it and all I did is write an article about it, and it just can't open a severe sore that we have in our industry. And I got hundreds and hundreds of letters. And it, now the good news is Velocity runs a burnout panel because of that. Uh, we might actually do a burnout survey. Um, we're talking about things that might save lives. I think it's pretty cool. All right, on to the DAO survey. Um, the, in 2014, I said that was the most, in my opinion, most significant, first significant one. We proved things we already knew. Job satisfaction is key indicator of organizational performance. IT performance is a competitive advantage. Organizational culture is one of the strongest indicators of IT performance. I love that, right? And here are things that we found in high performers. 
right? High trust, cross-functional share. In 2014, we also found some interesting things. The people who deployed 30 times, so we, what, the comparison was, this is something Gene's been doing for years, is uh, high performance versus low performance. Um, and, and so one of the things that the results of the survey, and you have to take it with a grain of salt, but I'll take those grains, um, that, that high performers did 30x more time deployments than low performers. And so the thing that always, and for those of you new to DevOps, the thing that people think about is uh, these counterintuitive moments. Like if I, if I do like 30 deploys a day or 50 deploys a day, everything's going to break. And, what we, and we knew that wasn't true. And Eric Reese stated this years ago, uh, the lean startup dude. Um, but we found in the 2014 that you were basically, if you, you were people who were 30 times more deploys than low performers were 3x more successful in those changes. And their mean and time to repair, which is a key indicator of how good you are at complexity, uh, were 48 times better. But this, well, this is where it goes nuts. In 2015, the, the, the frequency and the deployment lead time didn't change. Those are constants. But the, organ, the change success rate went up to 60x. And the mean time there is 168%. So we are getting really good at this stuff. Um, and this is some other slides. It's in the, the report. I have all links to this. Blameless postmortem, share responsibilities. These are what we found in high performers. Um, all right, ending up with um, the uh, DevOps um, enterprise. So another topic I want to talk about. So I told you early on when I first saw this DevOps thing in Ghent, and then we ran it in, uh, in LinkedIn in 2010, I, you know, I said to myself, be, coming from an enterprise background, that, oh my god, this has to happen in the enterprise. And I waited, and I waited. And then, um, you know, this is my first milestone, which was uh, Heather McMahon and uh, Ross Clayton from Target um, this, uh, last year at Minnesota gave this presentation, Dev Meets Ops. So Ross is Ops and Heather is uh, Dev. And they showed that it wasn't like pretty and perfect. It was hard. It was broken. It was messy. But they were doing DevOps in a basic, you know, massive legacy infrastructure. Right? And they were doing it like they were moving the ball. And then later that year, um, you know, a big argument that you'll have a lot of people is, yeah, enterprise can do DevOps, Sean, but they're going to have to do it different. And I'm like, bullshit. You know, and I get into large arguments with people. In fact, Damon gets into more arguments than I do. I've stopped arguing. But I knew, I, I told Gene, I said, when we do this DevOps Enterprise Summit, we did the first one last year, we were asking for a CFP for only people who did enterprise and had enterprise DevOps stories. And we got 200 respondents. I would say about 50 of them were vendors. But 100, well, let's say about 100 were vendors the first year, and 100 were like hardcore, you know, Macy's, Barclays, uh, Pittsburgh National Bank, um, Target, Nordstrom, Disney. And they were real stories, and they weren't doing it different. We had, um, the, we had the 2015, in fact, Target runs internal DevOps days. They're running a fourth one now. Uh, they, run four, they have to throttle it now. They've had 400, the last one, they could easily have 1,000 people in an internal DevOps days. So they would basically have 3x what we have in an internal DevOps days. Um, so this is the Enterprise Summit. And then 2015, which is going to happen this November, we got about 250 respondents. I would say 200 are, um, were serious enterprise DevOps stories. And here's the thing, like literally, uh, me and, and Gene kind of virtually blinked at each other when we saw this. The two respondents, one was Sherman Williams. And the other one was Western Union. My heart was like, like it doesn't get any more. To me, no, uh, no disrespect to anybody who might work for those companies. But when those two companies show up at a DevOps enterprise, um, you know, and they're telling their DevOps story, Sherman Williams, that's the paint company that's down the road from me. Or, or a Western Union, does anybody, um, nah, now I'm getting nasty. Does anybody even use them anymore, right? <laughs> um, getting really close to the end. Um, Gene did an amazing thing in April. He invited 30 people to Portland to do a two-day working session. A lot of them were the speakers at last year's DevOps Enterprise Summit. The idea is to create impact for change for the enterprise. Uh, we set up uh, five working groups. I was part of one. I was part of the, actually demystifying DevOps. Um, industry, industry leaders, we're going to publish this information at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. It's all going to be open for everybody. Uh, if you want to know more about it, it's still, the reason why it's not public right now, it's still a work in progress. So um, it, it's really, really interesting stuff. Um, and you know, metrics, security, test automation. Um, Cameron Haight, been just an amazing, worked for Gartner. This is the Gartner hype cycle. 
Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm usually not a great fan of Gartner, but Cameron Haight was at the 2010 DevOps days, is one of the pure souls when it comes to DevOps from Gartner. Um, he's been involved with it. He's actually taken a lot of information from people like Patrick, myself, Gene, Damon, and used it in his presentation. So he's asked for guidance, classically not how Gartner does things. Um, he sent me this. This is the uh, July 2015. Guess where we're at, folks? <laughs> yeah. The peak of inflated expectation. Hey! Um, so if you know the hype cycle, and I, I asked him, uh, you know, do, are there any examples of technologies that miss the trough of disillusionment? Yeah, you know, maybe. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, technology. Uh, um, I, I do a lot of presentations on uh, immutable delivery, immutable infrastructure. I think it's an interesting way to think. In fact, Netflix kind of, you know, I won't say invented, but the first time I ever saw it, we see some really interesting companies like Gilt and Yelp are doing this model. Uh, the short version is, Developers can build immutable stacks and infrastructure on their laptop, which are binary immutable, and push them through the chain green. If they go green all the way, they're actually immutable. They're the same bits and bytes that. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about infrastructure. May not, it's definitely not a one size fits all. Um, but I will argue that there is this convergence. So I've been doing this guns, some of the keynotes I've done earlier this year, guns, germs, and steel. If you have read that book, it's an awesome book, but I did the, I do it as uh, containers, gra data gravity, microservices. We've got this idea that this is a, this is a beautiful convergence. What we're seeing is microservices, technology, and data gravity. Real shortly, probably people are saying, what the hell is data gravity? Uh, Dave, um, Dave McCrory, um, he basically coined this term a couple of years ago. In IT, we tend to move data um, to compute. We're moving into a world where the data is too big, particularly in IoT. We need to start thinking about how do we move compute to data. The reason why uh, containerization, the installation time is milliseconds, right? We can start thinking about swarming data around, I mean, swarming compute around data. It gets really interesting. Um, um, Adrian Cole, Adrian Kokoff, sorry. Um, I would definitely recommend going to see any presentation he's done in the last two years. I'm stealing a slide from him. You know, faster, cheaper, safer. That's what I'm talking about here, right? It's about safer. Um, the, um, you, know, you build it, you run it, uh, change one thing at a time. These are, this is core principles in DevOps. These are the people that um, I want to give a shout out when I set out, hey, I'm going to give a presentation on State of Union. Do you got any input? So what I've just done is taken a lot of their input. A lot of people said security, security, security. <laughs> uh, so uh, Adrian Cole, Cole, brilliant man. Um, he's, uh, he, he's Jay Clouds. Um, anyway, I love everybody on that screen. Um, and here's all the links, and I'm done. Thank you very much. So when you're talking about the state of, of DevOps today, um, what are your kind of thoughts on these approaches towards DevOps certification or a governing board or the right way to do the DevOps? I, you know, I have some good friends that are part of that certification. I think certification is shite, <laughs> you know, to be honest with you. I, I don't, uh, you know, the I didn't get to talk about network and, and what's going on in network or on DevOps, right? Like there are companies now, they look, for, they look at your Cisco certification and they think, I don't want you to come in or do our network stuff, because you probably don't know Ruby, you probably don't know DevOps principles, right? So um, certifications are point in time. I, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, the group that's doing this are genuine. They think about Deming and ITMS. So in general, my opinion, it's a waste of people's time. So thank you. That was a great question.